What I can tell, we're behind schedule because the operator forgot how to operate. Good morning, Ryan Wilton. How are you? Good morning. It looks like I'm a little blurry. I don't know what's going on here. Well, and so am I. It's just one of those. I mean, we're having some difficulty getting one of the guests. I mean, at some point, you know, you have these flaw that go flawless technically, and then sometimes it just don't work. Right. Good to see you this morning. We're back with Beyond the Bell and uh, looking forward to a schedule that I mean, a, a couple of panels that are going to be very interesting. We're going to introduce those in just a moment. But this is our second from our our second broadcast, our stream from our second segment is where we're right. at right now with Beyond the Bell. It's the fall season. It exactly is. I'm still looking around here for logos and things of that nature, which I don't know where they're at anymore. But anyway, that's I mean, that's exactly how this works. I'll figure it out. Um, it's, it's Saturday. It kind of feels like a Monday. It does. There is every element to money, but what we're going to talk about today is on beyond the bell is agricultural education, which is, I mean, we've covered airplanes or covered right. aviation. And, I was, mm -hmm. and right after we did that, I started noticing the stories, right? Tons of stories about aviation. And this one I think is you know, something we take for granted. You know, well, a, yeah. a lot of people, I was just it's going to say a lot of people think me today. I mean, I ate breakfast and uh, I haven't yet, but I got to tell you, you know, so many people just think you go down to the grocery store to get breakfast. That's all right. there is to it. There's a heck of a lot more than that. So agricultural and innovative ways of doing agricultural education. We're going to see a, uh, we're going to see a lot of the orange school this morning. Are you surprised about that? Mr. Welton? Not at all. Uh, although I would note that this is the first Saturday of the college football season. Neither OU nor OSU are involved. Oh, I came in clear right then. But no, of course not. Oklahoma State leads the way in agriculture. We're also going to be talking 4-H. We're going to be talking uh, uh, with career techs, uh, public schools this morning, some folks from more. Uh, we've got, and, and, and students, 4-H leaders, it, it's just going to be a great stream. So let's just not waste any more time. Let's get right to our panel. Holly, stand by. We'll see if we've got this worked out. So our, our guest this morning, our first is Kylie Rennie Nicholson. He's with Oklahoma 4-H at the OSU Extension uh, uh, Project. And I'm trying to find you, Kylie, on this deal here. So she's not there right now. She is gone. Uh, Holly, Carol, we're going to try right now. Holly, can you hear us now? You, you good to go? She is not good to go. All right, we'll still be working on that one. Uh, Rose Bonjour, it's exactly how I, did I pronounce it correctly, Rose? Bonjour, absolutely, you did well. With Oklahoma Career Tech, it's great to have you. And uh, Jessica Dunlap with uh, more public schools. Jessica, good morning to you. Good morning. All right, uh, Ryan, take it away. I'll be working on some of our technical challenges in the background, but uh, glad to have you here on Beyond the Bell. And Ryan, take it away. You bet. I just remind everybody that uh, the Beyond the Bell series is brought to you by Every Kid Counts Oklahoma. Um, you know, I thought uh, we'd just start with some uh, discussion of where agricultural education is in Oklahoma. What's happening in the schools nowadays? I went to high school in the 80s. We had FFA, but I know it's far beyond that now. So maybe if just a state of the union of where agriculture education is in our schools. Rose, do you want to answer that one? I think that'd be great for you. And then I can elaborate on kind of what we do. Sure, I certainly can. Agricultural education is certainly alive and well in Oklahoma and across the nation. As a matter of fact, we're, we in Oklahoma, as well as across the nation, are experiencing large numbers in agricultural education. And I want to explain a little bit that we have a three circle model. We have the instructional parts so of the classroom, and then we have the FFA, which is a lot, a lot of people think of agricultural education as just being as FFA. And then the cir third circle is their supervised experience projects, which that's the uh, livestock that they may raise, that's working at farms, that's working in greenhouses, that's working at the feed store, so on and so forth. Uh, but it is absolutely alive and well, record numbers. We have a waiting list of, of schools that want to add agricultural education. We have over 27,000 people enrolled in agricultural education in Oklahoma. So it's doing quite well. 
And I think to add a little bit to that, what Rose said, you know, and, and you mentioned you grew up in the program or around the 80s, I think as agriculturally education, like we have totally had to be innovative, I, at least on a standpoint from where I work at Moore. Um, everybody thinks agriculture are just some cows and, and livestock, and, and that's not at all exactly what it is that we do anymore. Uh, we are leadership focused. We are constantly innovative trying to find school enterprises, our student-based enterprises at our school, which is kind of what we've done here at Moore. Uh, that's a little bit about us, and, and I'm sure we can go into detail if we want to. But I think in order to keep up with the times, uh, we have had to be innovative. We have had to change. Um, technology is huge, and you will find no, nothing short of that within our program as well. That's great. Kylie, your description here says that you're an agricultural literacy specialist. And when I was eating breakfast this morning, which, by the way, you can't have breakfast without ag, uh, what is agricultural literacy? What does that That's mean true. precisely? Okay, so there is actually a pillar. There's six pillars of ag literacy, but I'm going to give you the very elementary school version of ag literacy because you can chase the rabbit trail, but it's basically the relationship between us and agriculture and how agriculture impacts our whole entire lives, whether it's what we eat, what we wear, how we use our materials in our day-to-day -day lives. That's, that's basic elementary version of ag literacy and I um, go into schools and I partner with a lot of um, schools in Tulsa because um, that's where I'm housed, but I cover an entire district and I do in-school programming, after-school programming, and just educate students on how they impact the agriculture world and they may not even like know. <clears throat> And how have you seen students benefit from some of these lessons? Is, are they just uh, collective epiphanies or do you uh, sort of, is there a conversion there? People who say, you know, I want to actually be part of this industry. Um, well, I've only been in this position for about um, two years and I have had small little like light bulb moments going on in the classroom. Um, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's I didn't ever realize that, you know, the process of how I got my milk and my cereal this morning. Um, and I always, I'm a, I live in the rural um, area outside of Tulsa. And so I tell them that I'm a part of agriculture um, and also teach, you know, ag, ag literacy. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're a farmer. I'm like, well, I, I never thought of that, but yes, I am. Like my husband and I raise cattle and they're like, oh my gosh, I got to meet a farmer today. And I'm, like, uh, <laughs> I'm not really a farmer, but okay. Um, but yeah, they, they are like super interested in it. And I mean, in first grade, I had a kid this last year that brought chick. I did a little chick embryo project with them and they had never touched a live chin in their entire lives. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is super cool. And I asked them, I'm like, do you want to raise chickens one day? They're like, yeah, I think I do. Um, because they they just found life um, living thing as something way um, way bigger than themselves and like oh my gosh it's right here in my hand and I can hold it and you know they named it and it, they, they connected very well with um, just bringing a little chick into the classroom and they're like I think I want to be a farmer when I grow up so yeah I have seen some epiphanies as if you want to call it moments of, I think I want to do this when I grow up. Well, you know, in, in terms of uh, farming, I, I just recall when I was in my 20s, I was a sports writer in South Texas. I met a lot of farmers in the rice belt. And what struck me was they destroyed my pre preconceived notion of what a farmer was. They were entrepreneurs. They were business people. They were from sunrise to mm -hmm. dusk running a business. And the the uh, uh, like many other industries, uh, agriculture is facing a labor shortage. Rose, what what is the biggest problem uh, in terms of finding people and, and, and matching them with careers in ag education? How does this translate from students to the workforce? That is a huge challenge. And you know, when you ask the questions ahead of time, um, as far as what is our biggest challenge, definitely the labor shortage is our biggest challenge. And we're trying to do all sorts of things, both in filling the agricultural education teacher role, 
by having, we have what's called a, the SAR program. And I don't remember what the acronym stands for, uh, but trying to recruit teachers. And then also the other side of that is retaining teachers uh, because 58% of our teachers have less than 10 years of experience and 34% of them have less than five years of experience. So the attrition is definitely there. So we're trying to find ways to support teachers. We're trying to find ways to encourage people to get into agricultural education. But then for what we're teaching, the students that we teach, we're trying to find ways to match them with their interests. As Jessica had said, a lot of people think of it as just livestock or just a, a small aspect of what agriculture really is, but trying to recruit people who have no interest in agriculture or have never heard of agriculture or that get put into our classes, not because they want to, but because that's the class that fit into their schedule. And that's so true in smaller schools. And suddenly this whole new world has opened up to them. And it's not just about the livestock. And it's not just about the crops that we think of the wheat in Oklahoma, but there's so many other things that they can be doing. You know, you mentioned aviation at the, at the start or earlier. Um, and as far as aviation goes, of course, we have crop dusters and that's related to agriculture, but also aviation. And we have the drones and we have, there's a whole world out there. A lot of people don't realize the largest sector of animals is entomology and insects. And that's a whole other realm that a lot of people, they don't want to deal with the, the huge cattle, but they might be okay with smaller animals, whether that's sheep and goats or even smaller, the insects or whatever else it might be. So we just, we try to recruit, we try to hook people in with something that hits their passion. It's science. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it, some people might think of it as farming, but when I see this, I see ecosystems of science. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just looking here about uh, opportunities for on-the-job training, uh, learning experiences taking place outside the classroom where students are getting on-the-job uh, training. Jessica, if you could just uh, talk about some of those opportunities. So I can elaborate at least at what we do on more public schools, and, and I'm going to give them a plug because we have started a new internship program here that works well with our students. Um, we focus on a lot of college and career readiness here within our district. And so we have career specialists that work alongside us too and partner with us and collaborate all the time. So when we talk about that kind of program, I have several students. They, have, they are seniors this year, but they work for local people. Um, they tour industry related like machine shops. I, I have one that um, they're working on a local producer around here. So we have several things that are options here that our students can be involved in as far as work related studies. And I think that follows into when we start talking about our kids and their supervised agricultural education or agricultural experiences. Those also, I mean, by state standards, you're required for every student to have one of those. And those fall right along with those work related experiences because some of those kids, they may work at a vet, you know, some of them may work at a machine shop all the way down to I've had a student who owned his own lawn care business and he ran that thing from taking phone calls to mowing and running a crew. People, people often don't understand that, like I said, it's not just livestock and those related work related experiences. I have students in my class because we run a business here. They are responsible for talking to customers. They keep up with my deadlines. They keep up, they actually invoice to customers. And so I think, that that is one thing that our program does a really good job at is providing those experiences that are life skills that they're not only going to learn in class and maybe go to college, maybe go to go to do something. But those are skills that when they leave our classroom, they have skills in order to be a successful human or contribute to society in some way, too. Right. So and I'm just curious because I'm a digital guy. Uh, and I thumb through TikTok and Instagram constantly. Is there more that uh, the industry can be doing in terms of communication and spreading the word and maybe uh, developing audiences that way? Because I know that we talk about reaching younger audiences in the news business constantly. And I think that uh, I would have to think that somebody in agriculture is using uh, communication platforms like TikTok and Instagram to reach a whole new audience. 
Uh, so at least here at Moore, we have done that a couple of times, and it actually got picked up by the news to tell me something good. Uh, my students in the spring, keep, we keep rollers here, which are chickens, meat birds, that we would commonly buy all the store when we go to eat chicken. Um, we keep them here because a lot of kids don't have any area that's safe at home. They don't just don't have the space. And so that got picked up. But then I also run a full print shop out of our program here that the students are completely responsible for. And so utilizing TikTok, I let them make a video in class one day when we first started running it. Never, never in my mind would I thought that that would have been picked up by the news because I was like, how do we, and I knew we would have done something a little more professional. But in hindsight, I also think that as a teacher uh, or as someone that works with young people, we kind of work to try to build those relationships. And, you know, TikTok is relatable to them. And that way, making that TikTok gave them a way to be invested and give them pride over something they were making. And when they have pride in something they're doing, the light bulb comes on. And that's why we do what we do in public education. I, I love that you mentioned uh, the Tell Me Something Good, Something Good segment, Mike Glover. I vaguely remember that story. Yes. Uh, and we're always, for anybody watching, we're always looking for good news stories, things happening in schools and beyond. You can go to news9.com or newson6.com slash something good. Kylie, I wanted to ask you about the impacts that research and technology are having on, on agriculture. Um, what are you seeing just in terms of the industry as a whole and what your program the impact that it's having on the industry. Is there anything specific in terms of research and technology? Well, some other idol, I wear kind of two hats. Um, I am ag literacy and STEM. And, um, you know, OSU is the the top of the house and all the, in, all the research that happens at the university trickles down. And as an employee of Extension, I get to um, hear about all of the cool things that are happening on campus. I don't have any like data to prove to you, like, hey, this is what's going on in the last year. But um, during COVID, I mean, as a service to the public, Extension had to get outside of our box, um, especially when we were not allowed to go into schools and teach. Um, so we had to utilize, you know, different avenues of technology. You know, Zoom, what we're doing right now, it blew up in Extension and and um, we have to figure out how to get into school without physically going. And that was one innovative way, I guess you could say, that became a now everyday um, practice that we do. But um, we get to have all kinds of cool stuff. Um, we, we also, this is a kind of a hard question because I don't really see, um, the research that goes on. I collect the data and go in and, and be like, okay, here's a practice that I've done. And um, I, I might not get to see the end result of what I, I went and taught. Um, that data is collected way, way up above my grade. And so um, it, it does have, um, it makes me feel good about what I do. And also it helps me um, if I ever have any, you know, second thoughts about what I've done, I'm like, hey, can I, can I see the end result? They're like, oh, hold on, let me get it. And um, I don't know. I feel like I'm not have answered your question, but. No, it, it was, it was helpful to sort of uh, explain the taxonomy of how that works. <clears throat> hey, uh, one final question okay, before we okay. go to panel number two, which is how difficult is it recruiting students into the field whenever the last few years have been so difficult? So, you know, every day we look at the weather and it's record drought, record heat. It's not pretty out there. This is tough, tough business. How do you recruit when, whenever you see this sort of negative reinforcement to what's happening from a climate standpoint, from just, just the sheer numbers and the heat that we're having in Oklahoma. It is certainly not an easy job. And, and truly, people who are involved in agriculture are not in it for the money. And it is in, in born fondness, take words from the creed. It's, it's just, it's a passion. And once you, if you will, hook people into 
the world of agriculture and what you can do. And when you do see successes, when you do see crops that are produced and do well financially, when you do see the birth of a new calf or the, the birth of any I think we just our we just lost our signal with Rose. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Jessica, colleague, a, a discussion or a quick answer as to how you recruit during this time. I think at least from a public school standpoint, and especially a metro urban, very urban program, I don't have a lot of the tradition built in here, whereas maybe some of the rural areas do because they are so agriculturally focused. I mean, that it, all of our commodities here, uh, people don't understand outside of the metro that we are a huge agriculturally related state. That being said, I mean, for me, it's, it's like I talked a minute ago, it's that light bulb moment that we look for in kids. I mean, I have students that come in in the day and they have no idea about anything agriculturally related. And so when they see that it's agricultural as fish, fish farming, uh, when they see that it is teaching, when they see in my communications class that it is a print shop and graphic design, I think finding that whatever that kid is interested in. And, and what's unique about us is that I don't just hopefully keep them when they walk in that first day of high school. You know, I, I hopefully would like to keep them until they graduate high school. And so we build those relationships and we ignite that spark within those students. And so from there, I mean, you have kids that are fully invested. And I think that this this in agriculture, it's the way of life for a lot of us. And so, you know, I have students that don't really have an agricultural background, but one who she was we had she was just admitted into vet school you know and then we've got some that were are literally wanting to be ag teachers and that is because of people like us and 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 I'm, i know i'm not alone but when we are connecting with those kids our program is teaching work ethic you know and as someone who personally knows people that are involved in a much bigger farming aspect than i probably ever will be it is hard for them to find uh, good employees and I think that our program instills values in students. It instills work ethic. It instills a responsibility that they know that there is a cause greater than themselves. And I think that if I can ignite that in a child, then I, I have fully done my job. And I have created a, a human that is going to go out and be contribute and continue the passion that I hope that they have seen in me too. Callie, last thoughts on how to recruit during these tough times? Well, I, I don't personally work with students um, like Jessica does in the classroom. I, I work more with teachers um, having creating a relationship with teachers and allowing them to come in or allowing me to come into their classroom. Um, it's, it's like Jessica said, it's creating a relationship with um, a that school or that teacher, but also um, reassuring them that we are not just coming in here to, to push agriculture. Um, yeah, that's our that's our selling point, but we also want to tell them that it's not just livestock, it's not just um, cows, it's it's more than it's bigger, it's it's broader, it's wider, it's connecting themselves with something within agriculture, and it's something that pertains to students. Um, you know, teaching them that hey, your food comes from a farm, or and and also that process. You know, it it didn't just come from you know, pop it into the ground and, and it come back to you at the grocery store. It's the, it's the in-between um, that somebody had to market that hamburger meat that's on that shelf, um, teaching them things like that, that um, you're playing a part in agriculture, but it's, it's something that you might like. Um, it's, and in my area of my job, I, I have to reach out to not just teachers, but other avenues of education like libraries and, and community centers um, because they want to get the word out um, and that's just another avenue for us to to spread the spread the news you know everybody that eats is involved in agriculture um, and everyone that you know has a computer might be involved in agriculture also if you just you know stand back and look at it at a different angle well, th and by the way, we just lost Rose's audio. Let me see if I can get her back in so we can say, uh, Rose, we lost your audio there in this video, so I apologize for that. So. 
Okay. Well, thank you all for this morning. It's been very, very enlightening, and it's a tough job that you have, and, and we admire the students that are pursuing this field. And, and uh, Anyway, each to each of you, the best. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, all. Thank you all. Okay, so what would you learn there? Well, um, you know, a, a couple of things. Uh, the labor shortage, uh, scarcity presents opportunity. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for people. And I think just building awareness of all the different types of opportunities. I think sometimes uh, a barrier to entry is culture. You know, people think that, you know, agriculture is for the country folk. And I will tell you, this is big business. This is big science. Um, this is real career opportunity for folks. And it doesn't, not everybody in agriculture is plowing a field. Um, so I, I think the opportunities are uh, plenty if uh, people will just explore those opportunities. And I think the labor shortage is just going to continue to create those opportunities. Agree. All right, well, it's time for our second group of educators. We have a, we're going to try one more time with Holly Carroll with the Oklahoma Farm Bureau and uh, see if it, Hey, Holly, you got us this time. I think so. Can you hear me? Hot dog. I mean, let me tell you, she has furiously <laughs> worked IT this morning uh, <laughs> to get on. I'm good. How are you guys? Uh, we're great. Thanks for being with us. Also joining us in this panel is Steve Beck, a state 4-H leader. Steve, good to have you. How are you? You're muted, by the way. It's good to see you. Now you're unmuted. It's good to have you this morning. Thank you. Good to be here. And Greg Owen, the 4-H educator at the OSU Extension Department. Greg, good to have you. And Thanks we have Kylie Henson. At some point, she'll be joining us. But uh, you, you guys heard the first conversation. It's a challenging time. Yes, it is. I thought maybe we'd start off, uh, you know, we have a, a lot of 4-H here, and I think those of us who grew up in small towns, I grew up in Henrietta, we're familiar with 4-H, but maybe just for folks who might not be familiar with what 4-H is, what is it, what is its mission? Yeah, so so 4-H, uh, we are a positive youth development program um, that we focus on uh, teaching kids life skills, um, so that they can become um, productive, contributing members of society it, it is, is the focus of it. Um, we get a lot of, uh, you know, we get a lot of focus on the agriculture side of, of 4-H, the, the cows, sows, and plows, and, and cooking and canning. Um, and, and that's um, traditionally where we are, and, and we find, and those are extremely valuable um, areas, but uh, we also, um, you know, th those are the tools that we, uh, that we use to teach those life skills um, that are so valuable. And, and then we focus on lots of other areas in, um, such as leadership, robotics, um, and, and other technologies. Back to science. Uh, Greg, uh, what should young people who are considering, considering careers in agriculture know about 4-H and how it can advance their career goals? Well, I, I was listening to the first segment and, and I, they, they hit on the topic and that's passion. Um, in 4-H, we have over 60 project areas for kids to learn from, and we get them uh, from as young as five years of age up until high school graduation. So they get an opportunity to learn in, in these different project areas. And as they mentioned earlier, they get a chance to find their passion. And then as a county 4-H educator, it's my job to kind of guide them through those respective projects to help them um, as develop, uh, create mastery, uh, take on leadership opportunities, possibly piggyback into other areas such as public speaking, leadership opportunities, those types of things. So it's a great opportunity to learn a variety of areas to find some options that are available for them potentially to lead to career opportunities. Right. And, and Holly, you have a, a one such program, the Grown For You Mobile Classroom. Could you tell us about that and uh, how it's providing students a fun, fast, factual look at Oklahoma Ag? We do, and we're happy to work hand in hand with 4-H. I've actually been at the county fair this week in the local county working over there. It's that time of year. So we we have the opportunity for schools and communities to have our Grown For You commodity trailer come out and visit their area. We're about to approach year 10, and this is just an opportunity for um, us to get in front of the students and reiterate that where does your food come from question. And so 
to that is in Oklahoma agriculture. We want to make sure that we um, have the opportunity to show kids that right here around them is so much of where their food is produced daily. Right. That sounds like a terrific program. What is the biggest challenge that any of you see in terms of um, recruiting students into ag, misconceptions that they have. I mean, we talked in the on the first panel that agriculture is much bigger than just farming, although that's a big part of it. No, I I, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, pe people just see, you know, I'm, I'm not a farmer um, and, and or, or we don't have land and, you know, and, and it kind of stops there. Um, so, so that, that misconception is the challenge because it is bigger. You know, it, it's the the value added processing. It, it's just just the the basic processing. It, it's the transportation uh, pieces. Um, you know, one of the things I love about the, the um, teaching ag is 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 that STEM that goes with it. You know, you have that that science um, technology. It's you know, it's it's a fast changing um, um, industry, and and we need we need those scientists. Uh, both in the actual production, also in the, in the technology and engineering side, they're uh, advancing our our industry, and you know. But but I think that challenge is is also um, um, part of the key. And you know, so Kylie Nicholson, um, her, that position was actually developed with the idea of of using agriculture to, uh, as a way to to, to get in the using STEM as a way to get agriculture in the classroom, but also using agriculture as a way to, 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 to really teach and highlight STEM as well, um, because they go so hand in hand. And, and while a child, uh, you know, it might start with, hey, we, we took incubators into the classroom and we saw, saw chicks hatch, but then that really allows for that conversation of, of you know, we, we learned embryology science, we learned uh, inquiry and design, um, just scientific inquiry um, to, to some of those youth. That, how did that happen? Um, and then, you know, and then take that conversation further to, you know, how is this, how is, are we going to, 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 to feed the world population and make sure that everybody's fed? Right. And, and see what you just spoke to right there is um, audience development, reaching new audiences. Uh, are there any other innovative ways in which you're reaching new audiences and uh, marketing your programs? Um, I'll kind of buckle on that with our trailer. About 10 years ago, we started the trailer with the help of the Noble Foundation. And when we got into the schools, we figured out there's a need much bigger than we ever imagined. So we've been able to work through 4-H and community leaders and FFA teachers to just uh, offer grants to classrooms. Maybe they're buy buying electrical wiring board kits or hydroponic growing kits or accurate agriculture books just to read to their classes. Uh, we're just trying to find those needs and how can we fill those needs and also, as Steve mentioned, put agriculture in there just a little bit. Every little bit they can hear it kind of helps them recognize that the more they see it. Uh, we also have a we've been doing a watermelon growing contest for third graders and just hearing those kids stories about taking a seed and seeing it actually grow a watermelon that they can eat. That's like they said earlier, when the light bulb comes on, and that's the programs that we're trying to create and connect with our students and teachers. Ryan, I had a young person, uh, you were talking about promoting agriculture and, and um, overcoming the thoughts that were, you know, you have to have animals or this or that. I had a young person that joined the program more for the performing arts side of it and got into the show side of it with the, the livestock projects. And as, as she grew into her 4-H career, um, she found that she had a love for beekeeping. And as she got older, uh, she had more interest in, in teaching and the mastery side of it. So it became a goal for her to go out and teach at every audience she could in schools across the state um, and promote not just beekeeping, but anything ag-based. Um, she's also a big believer in our county fairs and the non-animal exhibits that can be entered there. And so she would always teach a craft uh, focused on that subject matter in agriculture. Uh, and it helped lead her to win a National 4-H Youth in Action Award a few years back. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because you've had four state 4-H Hall of Fame winners a state 4-H president and three national 4-H Youth in Action Award winners. And you were talking about leadership development. 
Is there anything different about leadership development in agriculture or what are some of the keys to success that you find with students there that if you can really break through with these leadership concepts that they will turn, they, they will maximize their opportunity? Well, again, as, as they grow in their 4-H careers, they're going to develop a level of mastery. And the number one thing is they have to find their passion. And I, I'm a firm believer in putting kids in a leadership role. So as they get older, and I'll start them as young as probably around 11 years of age, I'm going to put them in a teaching capacity uh, about whatever the, the subject matter is that they have an interest in. And so as they, they get older, their skill set Im improves and then they t make the projects more along themselves, focused in their respective ag categories or other project areas. Um, I had a young person that started her career um, showing swine projects, but then in the process, her mother developed breast cancer um, and she decided to start a wig closet um, to help cancer patients. So she just kind of branched off from there, but she used that avenue to go speak to community groups to promote uh, the agriculture side of 4-H because she was still a, a, a person that liked to show animals. In particular, it changed over to the beef project. So it's just giving them opportunities, but we have to put them in leadership roles. I also think that our ag students are speaking in front of other people more often. I think that they have more opportunities to uh, pr tell their story, talk about their projects, and that all helps develop leaders that are more confident uh, speakers and ready to be in front of groups of people at a younger age. Yeah. Are you finding any, is it, what's missing uh, in terms of uh, this, this mobile outreach and, and developing communications leaders in schools What's the what's the one thing that's next that, that you're that you want to attack in terms of like a strategy? I think for us just uh, to continue to push, uh, you know, broader audiences, more interactive as technology increases, our opportunities increase. You can now um, do the virtual glasses and actually feel like you're driving a tractor or figuring out milking a cow or you know there's so many more opportunities as technology increases that i think we can tell our story that we need to take advantage of those it's it's funny because we talked about that in our last episode of beyond the bell and we talked about that on the aviation edition how uh vr and ar are impacting uh not only developing new audiences but providing them with new technologies yes. um is, is that happening now or is that just going to happen like way in the future I think we're seeing it now, definitely. Um, and I know Extension is uh, using a lot of robotics and technology with their programs as well. Um, so I think it's here. Yeah, and I would agree with that. Uh, one of my students uh, really got into the robotics side. Uh, and again, getting back to that teaching, um, as, as, as her interest grew, she branched off into different uh, 12 different areas of STEM, with one of those main areas being robotics. And her goal, once again, was to teach in different audiences around um, the county and the state. Yeah, so, it, you know, one of the things, um, it, you know, this, as the agri agriculture industry continues to, to, uh, to evolve is, is um, you know, agriculturalists are actually uh, some of the best uh, conservationists out there because they have to care for the land and they rely on the land. And, uh, you know, and we're learning to, uh, to become, um, to handle many of the challenges um, uh, that we have with with the consumer understanding and consumer decision, and we're trying to always working to be much more efficient with things like our chemical use and and doing things like farming by the foot, making sure that we're not using any uh, both from a financial side of not using more chemical, but also from that 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 uh, environmental responsibility side. Um, and so you know GPS technology. Uh, Farmers were some of the first to, to really heavily adopt things like GPS technologies, drone technologies, um, to be able to actually uh, evaluate their fields um, on, on more of a foot by foot basis. Um, you know, you know, our, our agriculturalists are, are really leading the way in a lot of these technologies, um, and so we just we need good young people that can uh, 
help help them figure out how to put technology to use to to make us um, better <laughs> farmers and livestock producers. Right. Or, or, so, how how do you? There are so many uh, students out there who who might not be from small towns and who might not know these. How do we reach them? Is, is it social media? You know, I, I think uh, social media is great and it's a good place to, to, to start um, uh, to, to, to pique that interest. But but I think uh, every everybody we've had on the show today are our are, are partners, um, uh, Career Tech, Farm Bureau. And, you know, and I think all of us and, and I'm speaking for everybody, so I have to be careful. But I think all of us would say, you know, hey, whatever we can do to spark the interest is fine. But then what it takes is that that relationship and that engagement. And, and, and that is what we do so well um, with these youth and, and what helps them to, to, to thrive. I'm going to jump in for just kind of dovetail on that. All three of you have worked successfully with the young people. Give me an idea of the type of person that is succeeding in agriculture and perhaps some other fields that young people are looking, what could I possibly do that are the sort of qualities they have that would fit well into what you're trying to advance? Maybe kids have never really thought about the agricultural field. They're searching for where they can go, where they can make a difference in there. And like a light bulb goes on when they hear you can do X, Y, and Z in the agricultural field. Any takers, Greg? I, I think that gets into the project exploration. Um, you know, as, as they get into the different projects that you can do in the 4-H program, and again, we have over 60 to experience, um, they're going to find that light bulb effect. And I've seen it happen more times than I can tell you. And then they're going to gain ideas of what they want to do as their careers in 4-H um, grow. And as they get into the older side of that, then they're going to start looking into the career field. Uh, have that young person I mentioned earlier that went around teaching about beekeeping, uh, she is now attending uh, the university, uh, focusing on the ag communication side of it, um, more along the lines of, of this type of work uh, and, and promoting um, the ag side. Uh, so it's, it's the project exploration that starts as young as five years of age. And something that was mentioned earlier, I believe, in the first segment with OSU in the 4-H program, everything that we do is research-based information. So that research is coming from the university and branching down to us at the county extension offices for us to use in our programming efforts, which we utilize that to help those kids find those areas of interest which can lead them to career interests in agriculture or other related areas. Holly, your program, which goes to the schools, are, are, do you have any stories about kids who were not at all thinking about that agricultural career and walked away going, you know, maybe I fit here? You know, I, I think that we probably are igniting the spark and then we are there as kind of a statewide organization. And then we hope that their extension office and their local 4-H leaders and their ag teachers come in and help that spark flame into a fire. A lot of our ag chapters actually go into classrooms and do ag in the classroom activities with the students. And just that repetitive, um, looking up to those mentors, looking up to those kids, you know, it's, it's shooting sports, it's uh, archery, it's all the different programs that they see they can be involved in and just, and growing that. We actually have a shooting uh, sport, uh, activity this morning and I saw some boys in sixth and seventh grade there. So it's it's starting it like Greg said at six years and just how do we fan that flame up till they're in high school and ready to choose their career. And, and Steve, if you had an additional thought, by the way, in case we have an outstanding student, we're having some technical challenges. Kaylee, if you can hear me, well, turn on your camera. We're going to bring you in if that's possible. Steve, your thoughts on what Greg and Holly just had to say. Yeah. So I I don't think we've had a more caring generation of young people than what we have right now. They, they care about issues that don't only affect them, but affect the world. And so when you put issues in front of them, like how are we going to feed a growing population? How are we going to make sure that we have a safe food product? Um, how are we going to ensure that our land is still productive several generations down the road? You know, these are issues that, 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 they can get passionate about and, and that they, you know, 
they can come up with ideas and, and solutions um, that that we haven't even started thinking about at this point. And, and they're already saying, what if we do this? And, uh, and so, you know, I, I think that desire to, uh, to give back to their communities, is just really strong with this, this generation and, 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 and agriculture is a, a huge part of that. And speaking of that right on time, Kenley Henson, a state 4-H council member and currently in university and uh, champion. I think people could understand that right off the bat. Good to have you, Kenley. I hope you're following our conversation on, on, you know, what kind of student is it that really fits into this field and it's not typecast. I mean, we're learning that there are lots of folks that maybe didn't think they were cut out for this field that are. Yeah, um, it just goes to show that if you if you think you aren't cut up for this field, 4-H has a variety of things, not just on the livestock or um, the showing part of it. Um, there's robotics, there's um, canning, um, sewing. There's a variety of different things that you can do in 4-H uh, besides the livestock base of it. If you were thinking about if, if somebody, a, a, a college a colleague or folks around the the state who are saying, I, I don't know where I fit in this. Give me an example of some, maybe some fields that you've seen where students were not headed this way and they saw something in agricultural education that caught their eye. Anything come to mind? Um, yes. Uh, I have some friends that were like, I am not based for 4-H. You know, 4-H just focuses back, going back to the showing, the showing part of it. But I've tried, personally, I've tried the food showdown bases. I've tried cupcake wars. I've tried a variety of different things that 4-H has offered. And it goes to the speeches. I really enjoy the speeches. But I got involved in 4-H because of the showing. But now that I have stayed in 4-H and I've grown in 4-H, I do everything, but I do almost everything besides just the showing base of it. If you don't think that you can get involved in 4-H because of the livestock. Um, I want people to know that there's just more in 4-H and FFA than just the sewing part of it. You make new friends, you get better um, life skills like we talked about, time management, um, civic engagement, the leadership skills that we can carry on as we get older. Can, can I follow up, uh, Kenley, with one quick question? You mentioned the speeches. You know, there's a field that we cover a lot on News 9, News on 6, Mitchell Talks, called politics. And some of these folks, they use a they use a tool called speeches to get their points across. And I'm really, I remember 4-H speeches. I know FFA does this as well. Give us an idea. I don't know if you participate in the speeches aspect, but that's a skill that's a real critical skill in communicating these days, which people don't do well. Give us an idea of what that's like in 4-H. If you're not headed towards agricultural field and you hear about this, this may be something you want to learn about. Right. And um, when I got told that I uh, should start doing speeches, I was not a fan at all. But uh, when I started working on my speech and getting the, um, the information that I was going to start talking about, uh, which there's a cow in your gummy bear was my speech name. And um, I started giving it to my parents, to friends. The first time I gave it out publicly was in a McDonald's. Uh, people were looking at me like I was crazy, but it had, it helped, um, you know, get out of my comfort zone. And that's the main part that I started uh, doing speeches was to get out of my comfort zone and to try new things. Forgive me if uh, Scott already asked this, but tell us about the crown and the sash. Um, well, I am the Oklahoma Miss United States Agriculture. I was crowned in the beginning of August of this year. Um, Nationals is next July at the beginning. And my platform is agricultural literacy, where I enjoy teaching both kids and adults about where their food comes from. And have you given thought as to specifically how this will impact your career? I mean, I, I, I ask people who work for me all the time, what's your vision for five years down the road, 10 years down the road? What do you see yourself doing in 2040? 
What does your career look like? Well, I'm a senior at in high school this year, so I'm planning on hopefully graduating this year and attending um, Stillwater mm -hmm. and focusing on the vet medicine base in o OSU. I told you that the Orange School was going to show up today. <laughs> okay, they're bragging about their recruits. I mean, that's already, and this was so subtle, by the way, Finley. <laughs> Greg, thank you. by the way, who's sporting the swag. Okay. <laughs> and they're still talking about what they did to my university at the end of football season last year. Or so, and, um, by the way, so for, for uh, college recruitment in terms of this, uh, let me get back to Holly and, and, and Greg. The, the type of students that are pursuing this, are universities seeing different folks? Is there a, a new trend in terms of what the colleges are offering when you get into that major? Holly, if you wanted to start or Steve? Well, I was going to say, uh, Greg probably maybe sees this a little bit more, or Steve, but I think when you look at all of our ag organizations across the board, we have a completely different student that even when 20 years ago, when I was that age, what what it looked like at, at that point. We've got this urban draw now, this urban agriculture that has such a heavy impact on our rural schools and rural um rural product line like we know as rural members that we have to have the urban population they are our bread and butter they're going to buy our products so we have to be on the same team as them and i think all of our um, organizations now look a little bit different and a little bit more techy a little bit more um getting the uh, the older generation kind of caught up with the youngers and then now i'm in that middle of uh, i need kylie to help me because i don't know how to do it all so uh it's been that slow transition in agriculture of getting called up with the times but i think we're getting closer and closer all the time yeah and i'll piggyback off of that the and i'm glad what she said about kenley uh the kids are getting more into the stem side the science side the technology side of that and uh, I'm a little more seasoned of an educator and I do need those young people to help me in those areas and I've noticed that that kind of tends to be where several are, are heading towards with their careers when they head off to college. Greg you've talked a lot about passion but Steve you I think you really nailed it with Gen Z and it is purpose. It is a uh, you know, wanting to make the world a better place. It's conservation. It is uh, creating a safer food. Kinley, what of what Steve talked about in terms of, of caring? Oh, actually, she dropped off. I guess we might be having uh, tech issues again. Um, but uh, I, I just uh, was going to ask her what her purpose was in terms of her ag career. Uh, if she logs back on, we'll throw her right back up. But hey, I, I was, uh, I didn't get her high school. Did you, Ryan? Well, I know she's from Cotton County. Okay. So. We don't have the exact. Kenley, if you are sign back on, we'll try to bring you up on this. You know, um, I, I, I had another question just real quick that I was just curious about. You know, we have our list of notes and whatnot, but I just wondered for guys who look like me, you know, people who might be considering a second career, are there opportunities? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah, um, we, we um, absolutely. Um, we need uh, we need skilled skilled workforce. Um, we need people of all talents, from marketing um, to to, uh, to to STEM uh, type fields. So yes, <laughs> fantastic. Well, and now that we've got Kinley back, Kinley, I was just uh, talking about what Steve had noted uh, about Gen Z and, and having a, a purpose. One of the you know, people get into industries for many different reasons. And uh, it, it seems like uh, for the generation coming up, it is uh, about having a bigger purpose, uh, conservation, uh, uh, ecology, making sure that the food is safe. What is your purpose, if you will, for, for getting into agriculture? Um, my purpose of it is just seeing the basics of it. Start from the ground of the agriculture and just work your way up with uh, what you're working with and the basics of it. Like, know uh, that wheat, for example, has beards um, that 
that are called berries. You got to start from the bottom of what you're going to talk about or learn about at that purpose and then grow from there. All right. So it's, it's back to ag literacy. It's understanding yes. how, how the circle works. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of our, our stream that, you know, agriculture has already impacted me. I had something to eat this morning. However, I'm also wearing a cotton shirt. It, 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 I have things in my room that are made of fibers that are grown from the ground. You know, what, one thing that uh, I don't think we've really uh, touched on much, but, you know, as we talk about teaching youth ag literacy, um, that I think such a, a key part is, you know, we're also looking for more informed consumers and more informed decision makers. And, and as these youth grow up, um, you know, it's 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 easy to 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 get on social media and get a lot of misinformation and uh, and when you don't even know where your your milk comes from besides the grocery store. Um, it's hard to make informed decisions about whether your, your product's safe and, and your product's right for you. Hey, I, I would jump in for maybe one last question, unless Ryan has another, and that is to Steve, to follow exactly what you said. You know that one of the fields that is when we're having intense discussions nationally, internationally about climate change, you know that the agricultural industry is one of those areas that is a lot of focus is on especially in the beef industry, especially methane. We're hearing everything about methane capture, all of these incredible sciences and technologies that are out there that weren't there, or maybe we're just not reading about them. But in terms of, of, the, uh, of that aspect of it, how do you work your uh, criteria, the classes that you have, Greg, when you're uh, looking at what you need to offer how do you fit that into public discussion? Does that make it difficult to recruit? Not necessarily. Um, depending on what the, the requests are is how I focus what I'm going to do out in the community. Uh, Holly mentioned earlier, one area that is really growing uh, fast is, is the shooting sports area. Um, but I also have gone into a classroom and taught ag in the classroom. Um, but once you you have that audience, and I've, I've watched Kenley do this um, in her her, her role um, with with the Miss Ag, is you you go out and you teach. I had a student in a classroom that, um, and I was talking about agriculture, and they said agriculture does not touch my life. And I said really. So then we talked about the paper they're writing on the clothes they're wearing. As Ryan mentioned, the food that they ate for breakfast and how all of that comes from agriculture. So it's it's getting that audience and being uh, proactive to go out and, and find those audiences and, and teach them uh, where, where we're allowed to. And Kenley is a prime example of that because in, in the 4-H program, we're trying to get kids to go out and do these things. And she's at that mastery level now where she has that opportunity to, to speak to that. And as I found as a seasoned educator, the kids are gonna listen more to her then they're going to listen to me. Um, so she is our avenue for um, H and FFA. Those older kids are our avenue to reach the younger kids, um, which gives them a stronger foundation for agriculture. Yeah, and then I'll just jump jump onto you. You know your your question as far as you know when it comes to issues like climate change, and uh, w once again, um, our agriculture producers, um, you know. We're, we're, you know, our industry is directly reliant on, on things like climate and water issues. And, and, uh, and, and once again, we, we need this generation coming in, uh, helping us to, to become uh, more efficient and, 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 and continue our conservation and improve our conservation efforts. And uh, because, because we rely on them as well. And, and it will be the agriculture industry that, that actually is the one who, solves many of these issues i have no doubt and, and that's the great thing about all of our programs is that even if the student that we talk to in fifth grade doesn't go into agriculture if we can just get in front of them for a, a, a fifth grade year or a lesson in sixth grade they're consumers and they're voters and they are future politicians and so even if they don't go on to farm four thousand acres or work at an agri science facility, we just need to make sure that those, those consumers know the truth behind agriculture, that we aren't trying to hurt the environment, we're trying to help it and can tell our story just as well as us. Well said. 
That's a n- nice way to end it, Holly. Thanks very much for that. And I do think the focus on youth, it's really, really, it's pervasive across your industry and it's really nice to hear and uh, appreciate all of you today for being here. Holly Carroll, Oklahoma Farm Bureau, our friends up there. Steve Beck, State 4-H leader. Kenley Henson with the Oklahoma State 4-H Council, whose name I got on the first <laughs> right off the bat. And Greg Owen, a 4-H educator up at OSU Extension. And uh, best of luck to all of you. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wilton, that was a... I learned more in that one than almost any of them. And it's so, it's really foreign to me. But well, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, well, it's something that uh, uh, there are a lot of these conversations where we learn a lot and it ends there. However, I, I think that I won't be able to go the rest of the weekend without looking at everything I touch, everything I see, everything that I consume, everything that I put on and wonder where it originated. Um, you know, folks who are into, um, uh, sci-fi and comic book stories. It's not really my jam, but the phrase origin story comes up a lot. What's the origin story? Everybody's got an origin story and everything has an origin story. And agriculture is the ultimate origin story. Um, and uh, I just I just think that it is, is just an awareness of myself as a consumer, as a hopefully informed voter that I'll see these things in uh, a little bit different light. I do too. I, I'm, I'm now you've got me curious about that. So by the way, I will tell you that. Uh, so cowboy and sooner football kicks off next week. I do want you to know that uh, I, I read the speaking of consumables that Fletcher's corn dogs will be at the sooners opener next week. So I'll try to grab a couple and bring you. Oh, and, hey, I, I'm always down for a corn dog. Okay, so we'll be back in two weeks with our next Beyond the Bell. We have four more to go this fall, just before I think October will wrap up, but we'll have four more of these. That's eight we've had. I've learned from every one of these. I'm very appreciative mm-hmm. of Every Kid Counts Oklahoma for sponsoring Beyond the Bell, and they keep bringing us incredible people to interview from Farm Bureau, of OSU Extension, more public schools today with Jessica Dunlap. Uh, Kenley, who is a student in Cotton County, Greg Owen with the OSU Extension, Steve Beck, the 4-H leader. It's just always great to see these folks and meet people from different walks of life and, and relating to what they do and understanding what they do. And that's why Ryan Welton is thinking about every time I consume this, we can be thinking about the farmers. Brought it to us. No, there, there's always, uh, there's always, we're always left with something. Two weeks ago, it was the phrase, focus is the new IQ. And now, for me, it is the origin story of everything. Um, as much as we, Scott and I, hope that anybody watching this learns a little something, in fact, we learn a lot as part of these conversations. We don't often know until a couple of days before what the topic's going to be. Uh, and as impressive as these topics have been uh, the past eight episodes, I really can't wait to see what's going to happen, what we're going to talk about in two weeks. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining. And for the former Cleveland Browns, new Carolina Panthers fan, Ryan Wilton, who, by the way, I think Baker threw a couple of TDs, uh, the tune up this weekend. So sure did 21, nothing win for the Panthers. Uh, can't wait for opening day. As they say, karma is not a nice person. So right. it's coming. All right. So for Ryan Wilton, I'm Scott Mitchell. Thanks for tuning in to beyond the bell. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.